Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to our Wednesday evening Bible study. It's one of three that are going on right now at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night with the Central Church family. You can see by the graphic right there that the youth group is having their a Zoom meeting right now. And you, if you have a child that's in the high, junior high school, middle school, high school, and you don't have them in the Zoom meeting on Wednesday nights, contact JD and he'll make sure that works. If you've got children between grades three and six, they're having a Zoom meeting right now. And if you've got a child in that age group and don't know how to do it, contact Amber Adams. That's Amber, that's JD. And of course, you know, I guess who that is. And that's going on right now too, as is this class, which is primarily uh, for adults. And one week from tonight, if the Lord wills, we begin our study of the magnificent gospel that John wrote one week from not, uh, tonight, knowing Jesus encounters in John's gospel. And I have some homework for all of you that are going to be in that class. And here is that homework. Between right now and this time next week, I want you to read the gospel of John. It's 21 chapters. Now, don't divide it into little bitty chunks. It's great to study little bitty chunks of scripture and meditate on a verse or a, you know, a word or two. But there's something about reading in flow all those words. So John's, what, 21 chapters? And you can read seven at a time. If you set down first word to last word, an hour and a half to two hours worth of reading, and you'd read the whole Gospel of John, and you'll find these long stories in John, much longer than any other Gospels. Many times it's just Jesus and one other person. That's kind of a feature of John. But you will see how it all sequences together. So break it in half, break it into three parts, but long readings of John's Gospel. So next week we will be talking about what we all know about as we begin this fall study. And yes, it does begin online. We'd love to be together. And maybe before we get through with this study, even this year, we'll be back together face to face. This weekend would have been our central men's retreat, an annual highlight in men's ministry, always and forever been at Palmetto Bible Camp. Obviously, we're not doing that this year, but we're not giving up on the notion of a retreat. We have a date, we have a general time, and we have a play schedule for this year's Central Men's Retreat. It is Saturday morning, October 17, so much later, much into the fall, it's going to be probably cooler temperatures, and it will be held that morning at the Plyler Farm, the same place we have been able to go for the Fall Festival. Wayne and Virginia have hosted the church there for several years now. Well, this year Wayne is hosting the men for the men's retreat. And John Gamendi and Tim Fagan and the others in the men's ministry leadership team are putting together a great retreat, but it's just right up the road at the Plyler Farm. So guys, hey, if there is college football, we'll be through in time for you to watch a game. <laughs> and uh, it'll be great for us to get together in Fellowship, so several weeks to get ready for that. And actually before then, it is our ladies' retreat. Now the ladies' retreat was originally scheduled, as you can see right there, for October 2nd, that's a Friday, and October the 3rd of this year at Palmetto Bible Camp. Needless to say, that's not what's going to happen. Our ladies' ministry, our women's ministry team has decided they're going to do it on Saturday morning, October the 3rd, 9 a.m. to 12.30. The theme will be the same, Speak Life, and it will be here at Central, perhaps in the picnic pavilion or some other places around outside, maybe even inside if we're to that point and what we think is good and safe. Uh, for our congregation to do. So that date right now, ladies, save the date. Saturday, here on the Central Campus, Speak Life, the Central Ladies Retreat. So that does bring us to the question that I asked you to begin praying about a couple of Sundays ago and last Sunday and last Wednesday when we were together like that. This, what about worshiping inside? You be praying that we can do that. We're looking at figures from South Carolina DHEC. And right now, this is the general 14-day trend in the state of South Carolina and Spartanburg County, uh, percent positives. The occurrence rate is going down. It needs to get down to here before everybody says 
pretty much you can start doing things together. But we're looking for that trend to continue and not have a flare up with school starting. So if we can have uh, children together and teachers together for even just a couple of days a week per child or all week for faculty, and that goes for a few weeks, then we can say if they can do school like that without it being a big flare up and having to shut education face to face down, then we can try to get together too. So you be praying, praying for those continual, those trends that are good to continue. Pray for our elders who will be making this very weighty decision. Pray for the people in our congregation. We're coming in contact with it right now for sure. We have already. Uh, no doubt there have been people in our congregation that have just in the last few days come in contact with it. We don't want anybody to get this disease. We don't want anybody to get the complications that come from having that disease. We want everybody to be healed. We want everybody to be protected. We want to find medical cures. We want God to come in and work a miracle to take care of this. You pray for all of those things because one of the great effects of that kind of trend, we'll be able to slowly and I think hopefully wisely, with good decision making, get back together inside. But our outside worship is still going good. We had a great crowd this past week and of course we are still available online. Last Sunday, both online at 10 and outside at 9, we began a three-part series called Living for Christ in an Age of Rage. How can God help His people, that's you and me and a whole bunch of other Christians, in a time where there's so much anger? And we began looking at it last week. Well, this Sunday is Lesson Two, invite your friends, easy ask, YouTube, 10 o'clock, Central Church of Christ, Spartanburg web channel or to our web page, SpartanburgChurch.org. Or better yet, come at 9 o'clock. <laughs> the weather's been great. The fellowship's been great. The singing has been great. It's good to be together. And we will study that. This is the second week of that, which leads us to tonight. Um, we're not doing any new material, but I wanted to find something that would be a good companion to our series of Sunday sermons, Living for Christ in an Age of Rage. And last spring, in our study of grace, we looked at anger and forgiveness in an episode from the life of King David. Maybe you'll remember it, maybe you don't. It'll be good for us to review all that's taught in the Scriptures about forgiving people that have hurt us and dealing with anger and the positives of dealing with anger in a godly way. So you watch the next uh, 33 minutes, I think the lesson is, and think of that in context of what we're studying on Sunday mornings because church needs to be different. The church, there needs to be separation. There's one sermon title I saw, the separation of church and hate. And we can be big on that by learning to be peacemakers like Christ is a peacemaker and not give in to the addictive behavior of anger and the things that come from that. So thank you for tuning in. Be praying about all that. And now anger and forgiveness. Thank you very much for tuning in. Well, it was uh, Jeffrey Chaucer who's credited with saying that all good things must come to an end. I don't know if he knew about the sermon series on grace. It does come to an end today. But I do know one thing he didn't know about, and that is God's grace. Because Lamentation tells us that the faithful love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies, His grace to us, they never ever cease. And that's why God's mercy to you, to me, to anybody is bigger than any mistake we've made or, or all the mistakes we've made together. The things we've done, oh, we wish we hadn't have done. The things we wish nobody knew about. The things that make us cringe when we think about God is still reaching out with His grace for us to remove both the guilt and the shame. And not only the mistakes though, all the sins. Every sin. No matter what you've done, no matter what I've done, God's grace is still reaching out to us to forgive us and to take us into a deeper relationship with Him. And so our formula for this series is just so true. God's grace is greater than whatever has happened to us or whatever we've made happen to others. But Jesus says, here's another formula, it's even better to give than to receive. So as magnificent as receiving God's grace is, and oh, is it wonderful. Jesus would tell us it is even greater once you've received God's grace to turn around and give God's grace to others. That's even greater. But when will we give others God's grace? Well, same time. 
that God gives us grace. When they make mistakes, when they sin, when they even sin against us, it's even greater to give God's grace than to receive it when we've made mistakes, when we have sin. And so we pray to forgive us our trespasses, our debts, our sins, as we forgive those who trespass against us. There's a link. And here it is. The heart that will not offer forgiveness is the heart that will not receive forgiveness. And so we've received so much grace. What are we to do with God's grace? Well, last week we had a challenging answer. We show grace-based compassion to those in need. It's not based on how they ask for it or how they respond to it. We give compassion based on how much compassion God has given to us. And that is a challenge. But here's the harder one in this today's lesson. You know what we do with God's grace? We respond by showing grace-based forgiveness to others. It's not based on what they did or didn't do. What they ask or didn't ask for, it's based on how much God has forgiven us. But here's a caveat. It also means as we forgive, grace-based forgiveness, we forgive, it keeps resentment from taking up residence in our heart. This is our theme verse for the study. See to it that no one, not you, not me, not anybody, misses out on God's grace. Don't you miss getting God's grace into your life. Let's not miss getting God's grace into others' lives. But once we receive it, let's not miss showing God's grace to others. Why? Because if I don't show God's grace or get God's grace, my life's going to be filled with trouble and my relationship with God is going to be defiled by sin. Because if I don't receive the grace and turn around and show the grace, I'm going to let a root of resentment grow up in my heart. There's clearly connection. If I don't turn around and give God's grace to others, that root of resentment is going to grow up. Bitterness is going to be in my heart. You know what the cure is? You want to cut off that root? Just keep reminding yourself. I remind me of just how much grace I have received. But, you know, is that the normal way we respond? I mean, if somebody leaves you. They won't do anything to talk about reconciling the marriage. Do you by nature feel grace or resentment? Somebody, uh, you hire somebody in your business, maybe even a family member, and behind your back, of course, they, they scheme and they embezzle big bucks from your business. Is it natural to feel grace or, or resentment? There's an inheritance. One of your relatives cheated you out of an inheritance that was rightly yours. Do you by nature feel grace or resentment? And you don't have to be old. I mean, even when you're like, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and you have a couple of friends who you think are your bestest buddies, but you hear the two of them talking, and they're talking bad about you. You're only six or seven, but do you feel grace towards them, or do you feel resentment towards them? Resentment is so understandable because people hurt people deeply. But here's the warning label. Resentment is lethal. It'll kill us emotionally. It'll kill us physically. And as that text says, it'll defile our relationship with God. Kill us spiritually. Here's some passages from Job. Resentment kills a fool. People will tear themselves, their own selves to pieces with their anger. And the godless in heart have a place for resentment to harbor. That makes us foolish. And it just happens all the time. The story is the dad gets home in the afternoon. His little five-year-old daughter, she's upset. She's mad. She's crying. He goes, oh, honey, what's wrong? And she says, oh, daddy, I've been fighting with your wife all day long. It's common sense. Holding on to anger is like grasping a hot coal with the intent of throwing at someone when as you hold on to it, you're the one getting burned. Or holding on to anger is like holding on to an anchor and jumping into the sea. If you don't let it go, who's going to drown? You're going to drown. And there's this one. Unforgiveness is like drinking a cup of poison and hoping it hurts somebody else, the one that hurt you. Well, one final story from the life of King David. It's very much at the end of his life, long after his great friendship with Jonathan, long after he returned that favor to Jonathan and kept his vow not to hurt anybody in Jonathan's family with taking Mephibosheth into his home, seated at his table. And it's even after he sinned against Bathsheba, Uriah, and the people of Israel, but after being confronted, said, I have sinned, and asked God to forgive him, and God gave him grace. It's even after that. 
And it's a time when David is the one who is wrong. A couple of chapters in 2 Samuel 1 and 1 Kings. Now look, David's not a perfect man, but the Bible says he's a man after God's own heart. And there's so many ideas about what that means. Here's one thing. He keeps wanting to do what God wants to have done. He keeps wanting that, even when he messes up. So he, yes, is an example of what not to do, but in today's lesson, by and large, he's really an example of what to do when you're wrong. Three different scenes with a man, and I'm going to call him Shimei. I don't know how to say his name. And boy, does he try to. And yeah, I think he hurts David's. But David, David's heart. But David prayed, renew your spirit within me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. And I think we'll see God's Spirit creating in David a spirit of grace. And He's going to teach us to do what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Teach us to forgive as we want God to forgive us. So here is scene 1, chapter 16 of 2 Samuel, verse 5. As King David came to a village, a man came out cursing him. It was Shimei from the same clan as Saul's family. So here's a man with a personal attack against David, and it's a really bad time. Maybe the lowest moment in David's life because somebody's trying to overthrow David, and it's a member of his own family. It's his son, Absalom, and that is such a low point. Why would you want to kick anybody when they're down, much less the king when he's down? See, to to make sure he wouldn't fight his son, he he vacates the palace, and yet Shimei kicks him when he's down. Why? Look at the end of that verse. Because Saul used to be the king. God took the kingdom away from Saul. This man used to be royalty. Now he's just a commoner. And over time, that anger of what he has lost has built up and turned into resentment, which explodes when the opportunity is there for verbal abuse of the one he thinks has caused his pain and even physical abuse. The next verse says he threw stones at the king and all those people who were with the king. And then here comes the verbal assaults. Get out of here, you murderer, you scoundrel, he said to David. Now, Is David a murderer or a scoundrel? Yes, he killed Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband. Is he a scoundrel? Yeah, he tried to cover it up, but I don't think Shimei knows it. And I know that's not what Shimei has in mind. Here's Shimei's accusations. The Lord's paying you back, David, for all the bloodshed in Saul's clan. You stole his throne, and now the Lord's giving it to your son Absalom. Is any of that true? Well, what about the bloodshed? He didn't kill anybody in Saul's family. Quite the opposite. He let Mephibosheth come in and have a seat at his table. Did he steal the throne? No, God gave the throne to David. Samuel anointed David, but even then, David waited till Saul was killed in battle. All those accusations are wrong. And here's the deal. When people are mad at you, they'll just make stuff up that fits their narrative. But here's a key word. At last, Shimei I said, you're going to taste your own medicine. It's built up. And finally, the resentment can burst forth. Physical abuse, verbal abuse. And so we just have that. But I mean, what about you and me? I'm mean, Something like this story, you're driving your car through a neighborhood. A bunch of kids start throwing rocks at your car. Do you feel grace or resentment? Somebody, you know, your mate leaves you and that's bad enough. But many years later, they're saying it was actually you that wanted the divorce when it was Him or her that wanted divorce. How do you feel? Resentment. I mean, when you're down and somebody kicks you, is it grace you're feeling? I know what I'd be feeling. I feel I want to get even with that person. Now, let me just tell you, resentment does not make you a genius. Because not only is Shimei trying to kick David when he's down, he's throwing stones at all of the soldiers and the mighty men of David. Bad move, Shimei. How do you think they're going to take it? One named Abishai said to David, let me go over and cut his head off. And that is not a figure of speech. He wants to decapitate that guy. But how will David respond to this potentially resentment-causing situation? He said to Abishai, look, my own son's trying to kill me. Doesn't the relative of Saul have even more reason to do this than I do? Leave him alone. Let him curse. The Lord has told him to do it. What do you call that? You call that grace. And where does that come from? Well, David has not too long in the past 
received grace from God after he was a murderer and adulterer and a conspirator. And it really wasn't about what Shimei was doing. It was God's grace to David being turned and he was showing grace to that man. Now, there were consequences and that's important to remember. Forgiveness doesn't mean no consequences. Nathan had said, there are going to be consequences, but even though there were negative consequences, he still said, I know I've received grace. I'm going to show grace to others. And then he knows what we need to know. God blesses the forgiver, the peacemaker. Perhaps the Lord will see I'm being wrong and bless me with these curses. Now, I don't know what your expectations are when you forgive someone or show them grace. I don't know if it's low or high. I don't know how David thought Shimei would respond. But let me tell you, if he had any hopes, they were dashed. David and his men continued down the road. Shimei kept pace with them on a nearby hillside, cursing, throwing stones, and throwing dirt at David. So that's what resentment looks like. When anger gets stuck, you go berserk like Shimei. He is out of control. And friends, that's what's going to happen to you and me when we let anger develop that root of bitterness. It's going to need to be released. As Job says, you're going to tear yourself apart in anger. What does grace look like? Looks like David putting his head down, putting one foot in front of another and walking away from the conflict. That's scene one of three here. Scene two, well, David's army makes short work of Absalom's army, or put it in other words, Shimei's worst nightmare. So Shimei gets the word. He hurries across the river to Judah to welcome King David and bows down before him. Now in the Bible, this scene takes place at a river. I couldn't find a picture like that, so y'all just pretend this is at a river. But Shimei does bow down to David. And here's my question. Do you think Shimei is sincere in his apology? Shimei says, my Lord the King, please forgive me. He pleads, forget the terrible thing your servant did when you left Jerusalem. May the King put it out of his mind. I know how much I've sinned. This is why I've come here today. I want to be the very first person in all of Israel to greet the Lord, the King, you. I want to greet you. I want to be the first guy to say, welcome back, your Highness. Well, the way I read it, it sounds phony, doesn't it? But frankly, you can't tell from the text. Maybe it is humble. He sure sounds the part. But look at those words. He said, I have sinned. Would that ring familiar to David? Nathan said, you are the man. David said, I've sinned. I've sinned against heaven and against others. I was wrong. I deserved to die. Excuse me, I said, I'm begging you, don't spare my life. Is he sincere? I'd like to think he was. Or is he just saying... I'm sorry. Now, if you're one going, there's some people I can't forgive. This part of the lesson is core in my understanding, and I believe it's biblical. Let me try to make the point of how we can always forgive. So let's start with a story about our taxes. Uh, when Peggy and I first got married, first year we made, had jobs and made some money, someone suggested that we file separately, get a bigger return. We did. The next year they suggested we filed jointly. We did, and we did that ever since. We've done that ever since. But the IRS somehow recognized Ernie and Peggy as joint taxpayers, but kept Peggy as a single taxpayer. Well, after a few years, we moved from that location to Spartanburg, and the people at the IRS kept thinking the individual taxpayer Peggy should keep paying taxes. She didn't. They started sending letters long after any letters would be forwarded. So about nine years later, Peggy gets a call. She works in the school district from the district office. Ms. Thickpin, you need to come by and sign papers. The IRS is going to start garnishing your wages because you haven't paid your taxes. How do you think Peggy took that? Who do you think Peggy blamed? Rightly so. I'm the one who does the taxes. She called me up and said, what did you do to me? I don't know. Well, there happened to be an IRS uh, office in Spartanburg in those days. I don't know if there is now or not. So we went there. We got the last appointment of the day, and we showed the guy what happened. He had this old clunker computer, and he looked at it and said, well, I can see what happened. You don't know anything. And we said, well, what are you going to do? He said, well, first, let me just say how sorry we are. And... He said, well, really, that's all I can do. My hands are tied. What? My, my wife's reputation is shot at her business. You know, mine too. And, I mean, this is going to cost us. It probably won't get fired, but it's going to cost us promotions and, and respect. What are we going to do? And, he, and maybe he was a low-level bureaucrat, couldn't do anything. He did give me a phone number, and that night I got somebody in the regional office in Atlanta. Guy said the same thing. Hey, I can see what happened. You don't owe anything. And hey, let me just tell you how sorry we are. Can you do something else? I said. 
Well, eventually, they wrote us a really nice letter to Peggy's employer and to us, and, and we were exonerated. But I want to tell you, them saying sorry wasn't enough, and sometimes saying sorry isn't enough. Now, Henry Cloud is the one who wrote a series of book called, books called Boundaries. Recommend them. Really good uh, counseling, Christian worldview. He says the following. Sorry does not equal restored trust. Somebody hurts us. Do we still trust them? Sorry. No, sorry means forgiveness. They say we're sorry. We're supposed to forgive. But what brings trust changed behavior? Now, when, when I hurt somebody, you lose trust in me. Here's how it works. It's a good image. You spend, we spend trust hundreds of dollars at a time. We got to earn it all back. And you know what? You kind of earn it back just a dollar at a time. So saying you forgive somebody doesn't mean you're quickly restored right to where you are. Because frankly, when you've been wronged and then somebody says, well, you know, you're, I was wrong. I'm sorry. That doesn't seem to balance the scales. Now here it is. Make sure you really know what the Bible means by forgiveness. Forgiveness is surrendering my right to hurt you for hurting me. That's all it is. It doesn't mean what they did wasn't wrong. It doesn't mean what they did that they're no longer accountable for. It doesn't mean that somehow it's as if it never happened. It just means that hurt me. And I want to strike back at you, but I'm forgiving you. I'm surrendering my right to hurt you for hurting me. Now, the advisors to David, they have no thought of David doing that. They say, kill him. He should die for cursing you. And listen, when you're hurt and somebody who's been hurt in a similar way finds out about it, you're going to get some advice. Be very careful to whom you listen. The Bible says the counsels of the wicked are deceitful. Now, in my experience, and I've been doing this for a long time, when somebody has a really bad situation, when they're hurt, and then they see somebody else is hurt, and they come to, they become what I call an evangelist for how they handle it or how they wish they'd handle it. And sometimes they will tell you what the Bible tells you and God will tell you, and sometimes they won't. And because it didn't work out for them, they're going to try to work it out through you and your situation, and you will get ungodly advice like you hold on to that grudge or don't get mad, get even, or don't speak to them, or sometimes they'll get you to try to take it to the next level. You need to get get a lawyer. You need to file for divorce. You need to sue their pants off. Now, Scripture does make a provision for divorce, but it is always the last option, never the first. And you, there's even ways that you have, if you sometimes have to go to court. I'm going to tell you a story about when I had to go to court later in the, in the talk, but it is never the first thing. As much as possible, live at peace with all people. Be very careful to whom you listen. You know you need to listen to? Listen to God. Psalm 119, your testimonies, not only are my joy, they're my counselors. And here's God's counsel. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Well, when? When do I forgive? If any of you, has a grievance against someone. So I'm going to pretend it didn't happen. I'm going to pretend they're not accountable. No, it just means in your heart and in your mind, with the help of God, you say, I'm surrendering my right to hurt you for hurting me. By the way, that's precisely what Jesus did to forgive us. We're the guilty ones. And he surrendered his right as the innocent and perfect son of God to walk away from the cross so that we could be forgiven. We forgive others as God through Christ has forgiven us. And, and David says to those people, you're giving me bad advice. This is not a day for that, for execution. I've become king of Israel again. I got my throne back and he turns to Shimei and he makes a vow. Your life will be spared. Obviously that's grace. What does it come from? From what this guy has done? We don't know whether to believe him or not. I'm sure David didn't. He's now twice David has received grace. The grace of forgiveness in the matter of Bathsheba and the grace to receive his throne. And from the grace God has shown King David, a man after God's own heart, David, who had the power of life and death over him, gave him grace. He gave up his right to hurt Shimei for hurting him, which leads to scene three, which is at the very, very end of King David's life. He's frankly, he's on his deathbed. He calls in Solomon to give final instructions. And he still remembers Shimei. He says to Solomon, remember Shimei? 
He cursed me with a terrible curse when I was leaving the palace. He still remembers that. I, I don't, it's kind of strange what you might remember when you're getting close to the end. But he also remembers he made a promise. Oh, oh Solomon, I, I swore by the Lord I would not kill him. Isn't that wonderful? Where is it? Next verse. But Solomon, that doesn't mean that he's innocent. Son, you're a wise man. You will know how to arrange a bloody death for him. You know what the next verse says? David died. That's it. About my first year of being the preacher here at Central, I preached through the life of David on Sunday night. We had Sunday night church. Preached this passage. The person who led the closing prayer got up and said, well, Lord, now we know that David's not in heaven. Oh, no, boy, did I do a bad job that night. Of course David's in heaven. He's in the Hall of Fame, Hebrews 11. He lived by faith, not fully receiving the promise like all those other people did. No, that's how great the grace of God is. You can die in the very act of a sin and go to heaven. How can you be accountable? And we sin all the time. We never love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. If it weren't for God's grace, who could stand? No, David's, David's in, in heaven. But it's, here, I just fill in the blank. It sure shows that time does not heal all wounds. George Lemmy was a good friend of this church, worshiped with us for a few years. Uh, a couple of decades ago, his mom moved here, maybe even three decades ago, and I met her. Mrs. Lemmy had been a private nurse in New York until she retired, serving for some very famous people like Babe Ruth, she's a private nurse to him, an actor named Fanny Arbuckle, and a man who owned a lot of department stores, big bucks, very, very wealthy. And he was on his deathbed, and Mrs. Lemmy was his nurse. It was in the room with him close to the end of his life, and it's just heartbreaking. Outside in the hall, on the other side of the door, this man's, this man's heirs, children and grandchildren, were arguing over the inheritance. I worked harder than anybody else did. I get the most of the inheritance. You never visited dad at all. I should get the inheritance. And on and on it was. Uh, the sound was just cascading into the room. And Miss Leamy said she was just crushed. And she just knew this had to be the worst possible thing for the man who was dying. And she, she, just, she said she expected to see him in tears. But she looked at him on his bed and he had a little smile on his face. She said, sir, can you hear that? Yes. You can hear your children out in the hall arguing over the inheritance. Yes. Well, let me ask you, sir, why are you smiling? He said, I spent it all. One of my all-time favorite stories is apparently true, but the truth is time doesn't heal always. It can worsen a wound, get it infected at the level of the soul. And that means we can forgive and then the memory, we don't even try. The memory comes back and there comes that anger, that resentment, that bitterness, which means forgiveness is not necessarily a one-time thing. It's a process, which I think is a fair meaning of what Jesus said. Yeah, when somebody sins over and over, you keep forgiving them, but sometimes it's just the same thing we remember and we've got to forgive them all over again. And maybe that's why Jesus taught us to pray. Father, you forgive me as I... I, I yes, okay, I've got to forgive them again as I forgive those. Forgive against me. Forgive. Well, now, Solomon knew his dad's heart and he didn't kill Shimei. So, so David showed Shimei grace numerous times. Solomon, after David's death, showed Shimei grace. But let me tell you the end of this man's story. Uh, Solomon put him in house arrest. You're not to leave under severe penalty. But Shimei had a couple of servants that wanted their freedom and they ran away. And Shimei was so angry. Once again, he went berserk, got on his horse and ran out to try to capture him, broke his house arrest, and the army of Solomon hunted him down and killed him. And it really reminds me of the story of the unforgiving servant that Jesus told. A man forgiven much wouldn't forgive somebody that owed him a little. Let me give you seven practical ways to, to live this forgiveness thing. First off, let's not be so easily hurt, not so easily offended where the slightest little thing sets us off like we're some kind of, of you know, major hurricane or major erupting volcano. I mean, hey, I saw you the other day and I waved at you, but you didn't wave back at me. I'm hurt by that. Or, or, or you forgot my name or, or worse, you misspell my name or, or even worse, I sneezed and you didn't say God bless you. I mean, what do we say? Don't wear your on your Meaning what? What does that figure of speech mean? Don't be so, don't hold your emotions out there. Don't be so easily hurt. And one reason is when we hold on to hurts, they kind of pile up and leads to that root of bitterness coming up in our lives. Ecclesiastes says, be not quick in your spirit to become angry because 
Anger lodges, makes a home in the heart of people who will live their lives foolishly. Here's the second one. Let people be less than perfect. No one righteous, not even one. Both Old and New Testament say that. Jesus was. None of the rest of us are. So be careful about holding people to too ridiculously high a standard, putting them on a pedestal in that mega bestseller, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, from, I don't know, some decades ago. There's the story of a man, and he got married, and pretty soon after the wedding, he and his wife went to a party, and he saw her doing some things with a fellow that he took to be flirting. And it so bothered him and he lost sleep and, and it just kind of boiled over. So eventually he called, I don't know if we still have these things, but the radio call-in shows that give relationship advice. And, and he said to the, the counselor, he was a guy, he said, I just don't even know if I can trust her. And he told about the, the flirting thing. And so the counselor said, well, has she given any indication she's been unfaithful? Well, no, not that. Has you, have you ever seen her look like she's flirting again? Well, no, I haven't. He said, well, sir, how long ago was this party? And the guy said, five years ago. But I I still don't know if I can trust her. He'd held her on such an impossible pedestal of perfection, just a little slight stuck with him in a root of bitterness that come at me. If you, if you want to have a long time friendship, you've got to have a very short memory. You've got to let people, you know, be less than perfect. In the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13 says, love keeps no record of wrongs. So if you forgive it, take it, put it in the past, and leave it in the past. And if your go-to line in an argument with somebody is, i got a list of things you've done wrong, well, let me just tell you, the Bible says you do not love that person. Ask God to help you remove that record-keeping third. Deal with the offense early. The specific a teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. It's about lawsuits. Settle with your opponent quickly. Why? Because you don't know how the judge is going to be or the jury is going to be. Sometimes you can't. It takes two parties to do that. But that principle also goes into relationships. But we've developed all, ter- all kinds of figures of speech of talking about things that we can't, can't let go. We say, that really stuck in my craw. That's an image from a bird that gets food stuck in its throat or stomach and can't digest it. It's, it's six months it's been stuck in my crawl, or, or it's just really hard to swallow. Or just, sometimes we'll just literally say, man, I will never get over that. But the Bible says, you know, don't, don't, you, can, you can do anger slowly, but not sin. Be angry, don't sin. And here's one of the key ways. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. See, the longer wrath or anger stays, the more likely bitterness grows, which spawns sin, abuse, and all lying, deceit. We, we've seen it all in the life of Shimei. Here's the fourth one. Un- understand that forgiving others is for our own good. But when somebody hurts us, it feels like, finally, I got the upper hand here. I, they, they owe me, but science has said for a long time, and I've got an article here from Neo, NeuroCorp uh, magazine, that holding grudges can shorten your life. A study from Emory University found that bitter people had higher blood pressure, and they were more likely to die from heart disease than more forgiving people. This could be due to something called a C-reactive protein, which has been linked to heart disease and stroke. Here's how it happens. When we experience negative feelings brought on by conflict, our bodies get ready to fight. Well, here's the deal. Staying in that fight state for an extended period of time can increase the amount of C-reactive protein in our bloodstreams, potentially increase the, increasing the likelihood of heart disease. On top of that, prolonged feelings of resentment can also negatively impact metabolism, immune response, and organ function. Those feelings put us also at higher risk of developing depression and anxiety. We're forgiving. If nothing else, it's good for us physically. And the Bible will say the same thing. We know this wonderful passage from Philippians. Don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. And the peace of God, which surpasses human understanding, guards our hearts, our feelings, our minds, our thoughts in Christ Jesus. And there's a link to forgiveness. Don't don't worry, but pray and you get God's peace. And Jesus will say, Whenever you pray. Now, when I'm going to pray, well, I'm worried. No, I'm going to pray. Well, here's what you do, Jesus says. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. Who? If you have anything against anyone. 
so that your Father who's in heaven will forgive you your transgressions so that you'll know you are at peace with God and you'll trust God to handle what they've done. Someone said, pray, love, forgive, give thanks, and repeat. Fifth of seven, express kindness Especially if you're struggling to forgive that one. Proverbs says it. Romans says it. If your enemy is hungry, give your enemy bread. If they're thirsty, give him water. And boy, does that go against the grain. But the deal is, what I'm trying to do is certainly bless you if I could, but really it's just helping me get the bitterness out of my soul. So we love our enemies. We pray for our enemies. We say encouraging things to our enemies. You write a note of thanksgiving. Don't lie, but write something that you can legitimately be thankful for. Help that person's family. All of that helps us get rid of the resentment in our lives. A particular translation of Romans 12, 14 says, ask God to bless everyone who mistreats you and ask Him to bless them and not to curse them. And that's hard to pray. Oh Lord, that person really bothered me. Bless them, don't curse them. But that's a very unusual rendering of Romans 12, 14. Here's the more common one. You and I bless those who are causing us trouble. We bless them and do not curse them. And when we bless, pray for, forgive, and love those who are bringing trouble in our lives, that puts us in really good company. I right, hear the last two. And if you only remember to remember these two, because I do think they're the most practically helpful, remember how much we each have been forgiven and we need to stay off the judgment seat and get on the mercy seat. Let's deal with that latter one first. And you know, I'll tell you, there's a story about me having to, having to go to court. Well, there's a place right there that where I had a wreck. At that intersection right there, in western uh, Spartanburg County. I was driving on the main road. You can see there some uh, fellow came out of the side road in his pickup truck. It, it, he was going pretty slow, but he hit me anyway. In fact, nobody's airbags came out, but it pretty much totally did. It totaled my, uh, my old car. And nobody was hurt, and I was grateful about that, for that. And he, and he seemed like a nice enough fellow, only to find out it seemed like everything was going okay in his life except for the wreck. But he didn't have any insurance. And he wouldn't pay, and there's nothing I could do to get him to pay for my car, which was totaled. So even though I didn't want to, got some advice, and I had to take him to court, and I took him to court, the courtroom about like that, and eventually we got our court date, and we came in, judge sat down. And, uh, I didn't have a lawyer, he didn't have a lawyer. I figured I could tell the story. Policeman was there, highway patrol. And so I said, Mr. Thickman, tell your side of the story. I did. Gentlemen, you tell your side of the story. He had nothing, especially when the policeman read the thing, and then this happened, and it was, it was very, very memorable. And I even have a souvenir of the day. The judge said, excuse me while I step off camera. He said, Mr. Thigpen, come up, to, come up to the bench. And he took off his robe, and this is it, and he handed me the robe. And he said, now, you put my judge's robe on you. Really? Yeah, so I did. And he handed me his gavel. He said, here, I want you to hold the gavel. And he moved away from his judge's seat behind the bench and said, here, Mr. Thigpen, you sit, sit down here in my seat. So there I was in his seat with his gavel wearing his robe. And he said, now, Mr. Thigpen, based on what I've heard today, you've definitely been wronged. You get to be the judge. And whatever you say, this guy has to do to make it up to you. Now, friends, that was a good day for me. <laughs> now, let me ask you, how many of you are buying that story? I did have a wreck at that place right there. But why? No, no, no self-respecting judge would do that. Nobody, nobody thinks in any kind of fair system of jurisprudence that the people get to make the decision. The judge is the judge and the ones, the victims or whatever are the victims. And that's why we have laws and things like that. And sometimes it's more than just a little wreck. This is just this last week. It's these three teenagers out in California doing this thing. And they shouldn't have been running out to people's houses, ringing the doorbell and then running away and everybody you know whatever but one guy just made him so mad they're like 15 and 16 years old they'd hop in the car and this guy just made him so mad he saw him leaving their little car he got in his car and he chased this is true now got chased him chased him finally rear ended him knocked him off the road they went into a ditch turned over and hit something and all three boys are dead it really happened you can look it up but notice the parents of california boys killed Forgive the suspect. Here are some quotes from the People magazine article. Although the families seek justice, 
Each of the mourning parents forgive the suspect. Here is one of them. Jacob, that's one of the young men who died. His mother, Ramona, said her son would want her to forgive him. He would say, Mom, you have to forgive him. You have to because unforgiveness does not bring any closure. That's the forgiveness is good for the forgiver argument, and it's sound. But on top of that, there's this one. Forgiveness is what we believe, citing religious faith. I'm, I would feel it's Christian faith. Because of what God has forgiven us, we forgive others. And then more than anything else, the families want to honor their sons' lives. And what a great way to honor them by taking the higher road and forgiving. Will it be easy? No. Will there be pain? Yes. But there'll be more pain if they hang on to the resentment. That's why God says, don't take revenge. Leave room for God's, right, for God's wrath. See, if I insist on getting revenge, here's what I'm saying. See, if somebody hurts me or hurts you, there's only two ways that sin will be paid for. They will take that sin into eternity and pay for it in eternal judgment forever. Being separated from God, all that comes with that. Or they'll enter eternity in Christ and Christ's death on the cross will pay for it. But when I say, nope, I'm going to get vengeance, I'm saying neither hell nor the death of Jesus on the cross is enough payment for what happened to me. No, no, no. There's only one worthy of wearing the judge's robe, and it's the one who died for us. God says, it's written, trust me, I'll avenge. I will repay. Get off the judgment seat. Let, let the judge have the judgment seat. And then get on, get on the mercy seat. And then the last one is remember how much we have forgiven. And so maybe that's why we're told to pray. You know, forgive when we pray. And this is what we pray. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. When I was a kid, I thought, well, trespassing must be a really big deal. You know, walking on somebody's place, you shouldn't be there. But then I found out trespassing was sin. It's still a weird word. Maybe you've heard the old story about one Sunday morning, a teacher, a little Sunday school teacher taught, asked her class, well, somebody say the Lord's Prayer. And a little boy raised his hand when he got to this part. He said, and Lord, forgive us our trash baskets as we forgive those who put trash in our ba trash basket. And I think that's pretty good. Because you know what? We've all got this kind of basket where we, we kind of collect the things that have done wrong to us and, and people really, really have hurt us. Now we know we've done that to others. And so what we're supposed to do is, well, we forgive them of their trash baskets, right? Because then God's forgiving us of our trash baskets. But I know what you're saying. You're saying, Ernie, what they did to me was far, far worse than that amount of trash bags. And, and you're right. Your trash basket, basket was probably more like this. What they did, and oh, there are some magnificently terrible hurts. And what they did to you, I mean, it'd be this kind of size, that. But here's the deal. Yes, I'm not saying anything that will reduce the wrong done to you. But if this is how much is done to us, then this is how much we've done to God. And we could go on till we get to the biggest trash dumps and the biggest landfills because we never stop sinning. And the price that was paid, <laughs> it took the death of the Son of God to pay for everything I did wrong and you too. So here's the conclusion. Forgiveness is not easy, but it's commanded. Forgiveness is not an option. It, it's, it's a command. It's a law. It's re required of Christians. And forgiveness, it's not, it's not later. It's whenever you pray. And we're to pray without ceasing. It, it should be now. But where's the strength come from? Our ability to say, I give up my right to hurt you for hurting me. That forgiveness comes not from what they did. It's great if they apologized. It's great if they changed. But the ultimate source, the fountain that keeps never running out of water, that, that slates our thirst so we can forgive, is God's forgiveness of us. His grace to us is greater than whatever we did. And we have some big trash cans of sin, don't we? And yet Jesus says, as great as that is, it's even greater to take that grace in and share that grace with others. Even greater to give it than to receive it. And when we do, we are in the very best of companies. Let's pray. Father, help us just let Your grace do its work. 
It demands to be shared with others. The grace of the plan of salvation, the good news of Jesus, and the grace to forgive others, to give up our right to retaliate. Thank you for forgiving us, and thank you for giving us the strength to forgive others. For any pain or hurt this sermon has brought to the surface, send your healing Holy Spirit, the Comforter. And may we remember the price that was paid to forgive us. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Son. And thank you, Spirit, for being in us to give us the strength to live a life for Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You want that forgiveness in your life? You've got to be linked with that death, burial, and resurrection through faith. Call us. We'll help you. We'll help you do that. Reach out to one of your Christian friends. Call up somebody in your life group if this is a tough one for you and ask them just to pray for you about today's lesson. Let's not let any root of bitterness come up in us. Let's be people who show grace because we've been shown so much grace. We'll close by singing a song about that great love which never ceases.